hello friends, thank you for joining our study. I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. Know ye that the world of existence is a single world, although its stations are various and distinct. For example, the mineral life occupies its own plane, but a mineral entity is without any awareness at all of the vegetable kingdom, and indeed, with its inner tongue denieth that there is any such kingdom. In the same way, a vegetable entity knoweth nothing of the animal world, remaining completely heedless and ignorant thereof, for the stage of the animal is higher than that of the vegetable, and the vegetable is veiled from the animal world, and inwardly denieth the existence of that world. All this while animal, vegetable, and mineral dwell together, in the one world. In the same way the animal remaineth totally unaware of that power of the human mind which graspeth universal ideas and layeth bare the secrets of creation. So that a man who liveth in the East can make plans and arrangements for the West, can unravel mysteries, although located on the continent of Europe, can discover America although sighted on the earth can lay hold of the inner realities of the stars of heaven. Of this power of discovery which belongs to the human mind, this power which can grasp abstract and universal ideas, the animal remaineth totally ignorant, and indeed denieth its existence. In the same way, the denizens of this earth are completely unaware of the world of the kingdom, and deny the existence thereof. They ask, for example, where is the kingdom? Where is the Lord of the kingdom? These people are even as the mineral and the vegetable, who know nothing whatever of the animal and the human realm. They see it not, they find it not. Yet the mineral and vegetable, the animal and man, are all living here together in this world of existence. I think what's so beautiful about this quote is it gives us insight into where the worlds of God are and how they relate to the world in which we live. Because here it's talking about the animal, the vegetable, uh, and the mineral and their existence in relationship to ours, and how each of these levels is actually present in the same space, if you will, and in the same realm, yet at the same time because of the barriers uh, to access. Um, we are unaware of them. So you have the mineral in the same domain as you have the vegetable, and the animal, and the human, and the spiritual worlds beyond these. So for example, if I'm standing in my living room, and in my living room is a plant, there is a chair, there is my dog, <laughs> and myself, they all exist, coexist really, in the same domain, and yet the chair say it's made out of wood or it's made out of metal, has no access or no awareness of the fact that there is a plant sitting on top of it. And that plant has no access or awareness, for example, that there is a dog running around. And I myself can be aware of all of these. The animal, the dog, is not cognizant of the fact that there is a conversation going on between myself, for example, and my wife, which is, say, about physics, or history, or sociology, or philosophy. Um, the only things he has access to is potentially when I say the word walk, or treat. These are the only things that that animal is capable of being aware of. Now that animal might be aware of the plant, and that there's a chair. Yet the real, real, if you will, recognition of all the different grades of being would only be within my mind. And I think when we read these passages within the Baha'i Writings, we see that the worlds beyond what we might, for example, term the supernatural worlds, 
are not supernatural in the sense that they are somewhere else, or supernatural in the sense that they are something else in the way that completely separate, but rather it is simply that they are of a grade above us, like we are above the animal, or the animal is above the vegetable, or the plant kingdom. They're all coexisting at once. And what we mean by supernatural, as we see in passages from Abdu'l-Baha, is that the plant is supernatural to the mineral, the animal is supernatural to the plant, we are supernatural to that animal, and the worlds beyond are supernatural to us. It is not that there is a completely different realm of existence, it's simply that we are looking at all these different kingdoms and accessing them in different ways. As Abdu'l-Baha says, Yet the mineral and vegetable, the animal and man, are all living here together in this world of existence. I remember seeing a picture once years and years ago, and I used it in a presentation, where there's actually a marine biologist, a woman bending down in front of an orca. And as she's bending down, you can actually see a fish um, jumping in the background. And at the same time, you could imagine there being like a barnacle upon that whale. All of these realms are present. There is the water, there is the dock that she's standing on. There is this living creature in a sense, the barnacle on, on the whale. There is a fish, and there is this orca, and a human. All of them are coexisting at once within that domain, yet their ability to understand and access each of them is radically different. She understands the ecology of this, of the whale, and of the barnacle, and of the fish, and of what's going on underneath the water. This whale, this great being, actually has some access to a relationship between her and him, or her. <laughs> and the same thing goes the fish in the background, might have no awareness whatsoever of what's going on around it, but is obviously more aware than the water. Each of these domains being supernatural to the other. So when we look at and reflect on upon the worlds of existence, we have to try our best to remember and really, really, if you will, take this to heart and understand that the kingdoms, if you will, um, are all in one place. They are all existing at one time, and yet are unaware of each other. This quote also makes me think of multiple discussions I've had in the past where I've been talking to a friend or to a seeker, and they've said, well, it's just difficult because you believe in the supernatural. And to make a point, in the past I have said, but I don't. And they'll re respond, well, of course you do. You believe in you know, uh, realms beyond, you believe in God, and you believe in manifestations of God, if you will, the prophets. And I would say, but I don't believe in the supernatural. These are all natural phenomenon. They are all part of the world. Uh, to make sense of this, <laughs> in the past I've said, for example, uh, most people will consider, say, ghosts as supernatural. Yet if they were real, and if we suddenly discerned that they actually are a real phenomenon, something that can then be uh, understood, documented, and explored, then suddenly we would actually recognize that ghosts, if they were real, <laughs> would be a natural phenomenon of our world, and we would begin to reflect upon them. At that very moment it would transform from that which is supernatural to that which is natural, but the only thing that has changed is our understanding or our interpretation of the world in which we live. So when it comes, for example, to the existence of worlds beyond, and even of messengers of God, if I understand them to be part of the natural order of reality, to be just what is, then they become natural. The questioner remarked that many differing opinions were held as to the conditions of the future life. Some thought that all would have exactly the same perfections and virtues, that all would be alike and equal. Abdu'l-Baha said there would be variety and differing degrees of attainment as in this world. In this quote, we are told that there would be variety or differing degrees of attainment as in this world. 
So in this world, we see different degrees of attainment and different kingdoms and different structures and levels, and that is the same in the next world. The following quote is from the Bob. No created thing shall ever attain its paradise, unless it appeareth in its highest prescribed degree of perfection. For instance, this crystal representeth the paradise of the stone, whereof it, its substance is composed. Likewise, there are various stages in the paradise for the crystal itself. So long as it was stone, it was worthless. But if it attaineth the excellence of ruby, a potentiality which is latent in it, how much a carat will it be worth? Consider likewise every created thing. In this quote, we are told that the paradise of a thing, <laughs> of a station, is to actually acquire the highest degree of perfection prescribed there. So while we are, say, for example, through our actions, through our knowledge, through our conduct, and through our seeking, are attain us, we attain a certain station in the next world, there is perfections within that station that we are actually placed within. And that our paradise is within that station to achieve the highest degree of perfection we can. This next quote is from Baha'u'llah. The people of Baha, who are the inmates of the Ark of God, are, one and all, well aware of one another's state and condition, and are united in the bonds of intimacy and fellowship. Such a state, however, must depend upon their faith and their conduct. They that are of the same grade and station are fully aware of one another's capacity, character, accomplishments, and merits. They that are of a lower grade, however, are incapable of comprehending adequately the station or of estimating the merits of those that rank above them. So in this quote, we're told that those who are of the same grade, those who are of the same level, can actually estimate the worth of the individual that they are addressing or interacting with within the next world, yet that those who are of a lower nature are incapable of doing so. And this should actually make a lot of sense, because when we think about it, if I am sitting in front of a world-class violinist, I actually know that this individual is, say, profoundly skilled. But unless I myself am a violinist, I will not be able to truly estimate the merit of this world-class violinist. And if we start to scale up this idea, we realize that we can't truly estimate the worth or value of a world-class violinist unless we are that world-class violinist. The same goes in the domain of knowledge. If I am sitting in front of Albert Einstein as a fledgling physicist or as a lay physicist, if I'm trying to understand Einstein, I can't truly estimate the brilliance of an Einstein I might know that there's something strange about him. I might know that he's quite an intelligent individual, but to really truly grasp, if you will, the station of a Nobel Prize laureate in physics, I actually have to be one of those individuals. And the same is in the next world. So if I am of a lower grade or a lower station within the next world, I can, I believe personally that I can actually see that there is something strange about this character. Yet there is a block for my ability <laughs> to truly estimate their merits, truly estimate their worth. And as we'll see, this makes more sense as we move along. I swear by him who hath caused me to reveal whatever hath pleased him. Ye are better known to the inmates of the kingdom on high than ye are known to your own selves. It's interesting in this quote because he says we are better known to the inmates of the kingdom then we are known to our own selves. And I think of this often like when you're talking to a child, for example, you're aware often of the struggles that they are going through. You're aware of some of the intellectual obstacles that they are actually facing. In a sense, you might have a bird's eye view of this creature, <laughs> a, a child. And the same, I believe, what I understand from the writings, is the same from the next world. They are seeing a larger picture. They have a better comprehension of the grand scheme of things, even if there are grades and stations infinitely above them. But they themselves are able to know what it is that you are capable of, know your potentialities, and know the end result of the actions 
that you are currently undertaking. Whereas we are actually prevented because, if you will, the veil of the mother's tummy of the womb that we are in. Uh, the next quote is actually from Abdu'l-Baha. The animal cannot realize the intelligence of a human being. He only knows that which is perceived by his animal senses. He cannot imagine anything in the abstract. An animal could not learn that the world is round, that the earth revolves around the sun, or the construction of the electric telegraph. These things are only possible to man. Man is the highest work of creation, the nearest to God of all creatures. All superior kingdoms are incomprehensible to the inferior. How, therefore, could it be possible that the creature, man, should understand the Almighty Creator of all? That which we imagine is not the reality of God. He, the unknowable, the unthinkable, is far beyond the highest conception of man. Here again we have this notion of, if you will, the obstacles to the capacity of an intellect to understand and fully grasp a station that is above them. Uh, Abdu'l-Bahá here uses the um, analogy of an animal. And I've often joked in you know, giving talks or sitting around with friends, um, you know, my dog, for example, um, can know I'm there. He can fully be aware that I exist. Yet his capacity to really understand anything of the things that I'm saying other than walk or treat <laughs> Uh, is completely shielded from him. We could be having a profound discussion about physics, or a wonderful discussion about history, or the nobility of humankind, and to my dog, Cody, that is just a bunch of barking. It's very important because here the examples given by Abdu'l-Bahá are scientific knowledge, the electric telegraph, the roundness of the earth. There's no uh, advanced abstract reasoning within the animal kingdom. And this means that all superior kingdoms, quoting, are incomprehensible to the inferior. Now I believe this goes both for our comprehension of the worlds beyond, but also in those varieties, in those different stations of rank and capacity in the next world, we are in basically we are in not able to comprehend those that are of a grade above us. When we view the world of creation, we discover differences in degree which make it impossible for the lower to comprehend the higher. For example, the mineral kingdom, no matter how much it may advance, can never comprehend the phenomena of the vegetable kingdom. Whatever development the vegetable may attain, it can have no message from nor come in touch with the kingdom of the animal. However perfect may be the growth of a tree, it cannot realize the sensation of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. These are beyond its limitation. Although it is the possessor of existence in the world of creation, a tree, nevertheless, has no knowledge of the superior degree of the animal kingdom. Likewise, no matter how great the advancement of the animal, it can have no idea of the human plane no knowledge of intellect and spirit. Difference in degree is an obstacle to this comprehension. A lower degree cannot comprehend a higher, although all are in the same world of creation, whether mineral, vegetable, or animal. Degree is the barrier and limitation. In the human plane of existence, we can say we have knowledge of a vegetable, its qualities and product. But the vegetable has no knowledge or comprehension whatever of us. No matter how near perfection this rose may advance in its own sphere, it can never possess hearing and sight. Inasmuch as in the creational world, which is phenomenal, difference of degree is an obstacle or hindrance to comprehension, how can the human being, which is a created exigency, comprehend the ancient divine reality, which is essential. This is impossible because the reality of divinity is sanctified beyond the comprehension of the created being, man. So in here, once again, we see that the difference of degree is an obstacle to comprehension. That no matter how advanced a plant might be, it cannot comprehend 
the world of the senses. It can't understand sight or hearing or taste or smell. And I believe this, this analogy is actually going to serve us well as we continue, uh, and it's just like the analogy of the embryo. Because the embryo that's actually in the womb, um, that being itself has eyes, it has ears, it has a tongue, it has a nose, it has arms, it has legs, it has hands, it has feet. And in each of these cases, the function and purpose of those worlds of senses and mobility are not for the world of the womb. They are only once they are birthed into the next world that they actually can use them. And the analogy with using the Baha'i writings is that if we don't develop them here, they're not ready for the next world. So that there is a sense, no pun intended, <laughs> that our senses actually have to be developed so that we can move about and understand the worlds beyond. And we're told here, like he says, that the animal, no matter how much it goes in the prior quote, cannot understand the concepts of abstract, abstract reasoning. They can't understand that the world is round. They can't understand uh, what electromagnetism is, for example. And this ends up being a block for them understanding the human kingdom. And just like in the next world, we might be encountering beings that actually are of a grade or station above us, and yet at the same time we still cannot fully grasp what they are. But wait a minute. The following quote from Some Answered Questions appears to cause some problems for our notion of not being able to see up and not having those senses. As to thy question regarding discoveries made by the soul after it hath put off its human form, certainly that world is a world of perceptions and discoveries, for the interposed veil will be lifted away, and the human spirit will gaze upon souls that are above, below, and on par with itself. It is similar to the condition of a human being in the womb, where his eyes are veiled and all things are hidden away from him. Once he is born out of the uterine world and entereth this life, he findeth it, with relation to that of the womb, to be a place of perceptions and discoveries, and he observeth all things through his outer eye. In the same way, once he hath departed this life, he will behold in that world whatsoever was hidden from him here. But there he will look upon and comprehend all things with his inner eye. There will he gaze on his fellows and his peers, and those in the ranks above him and those below. As for what is meant by the equality of souls in the all-highest realm, it is this. The souls of the believers at the time when they first become manifest in the world of the body, are equal, and each is sanctified and pure. In this world, however, they will begin to differ one from another, some achieving the highest station, some a middle one, others remaining at the lowest stage of being. Their equal status is at the beginning of their existence. The differentiation followeth their passing away. So in this section, abdul Baha says the human spirit will gaze upon souls that are above, below, and on a par with itself. As well, there he will gaze on fellows and his peers, and those in ranks above him, and those below. And we are told that the differentiation of humankind appears after our passing away. Um, this seems on the surface to take this idea of our inability to access or understand those above or see above and below. Um, it, it seems inconsistent. And I think, however, that the notions regarded to the sense organs and the sense capacities are themselves our gateway into understanding this. Uh, I often imagine attempting to communicate an, ind an individual uh, who is born blind, no capacity to see, what colors actually are. And this seems on the surface like we would actually have a lot of avenues to do so. We can start, for example, using, say, something that is cold to communicate blue. Or we might use warmth to communicate redness. Uh, starting in a low heat, <laughs> if you will, with yellow and scaling it up to, to red and to burning hot. We can do the same thing with music. We can attempt, for example, to use notions of visual rising and falling. 
um, to really give someone the ability to understand, if they're unable to hear, what music is like. We can use the sense of vibration, so someone can someone get a handle on what it is to be going up in pitch. Yet at the same time, these individuals, while being able to stand in front of someone who is not on a par with themselves in, this, in the world of, say, listening, hearing, or the world of sight. They can stand in front of this individual that is not on a par with themselves in these sense capacities and gain some understanding of what it is, yet no matter how much they do, they're going to be unable of truly estimating and comprehending, say, the profound beauty of a Van Gogh painting, or the shocking wonder of something written by Beethoven. Why? Because the vast array of that world of sound, or that vast world of music, or that world of colour and visual representation is completely blocked off from them. So can they stand before someone, in the case of, say, their ability to sense the, the sound or sight, or someone who's not on a par with themselves? Yes, they can. And I think that actually such individuals would be able to, for example, look below them and see well, this individual is incapable of truly, truly accessing the world of tactile feeling. And I'm trying to communicate to this individual what it's like to feel something. Or, for example, someone who has a perfectly, if you will, uh, fluid and movement and graceful uh, physical spiritual body. This individual below them can't understand what it means to fly, or can't understand what it means to soar. And they're trying to communicate to this individual, and then they have another individual who's trying to communicate to them something which is, which is the analog, if you will, of sound. They can intuit that there is a domain of senses, a domain and range of experience that they themselves are blocked off from, because they can see those below them, and that there is a domain that is actually blocked off from them, and they are attempting to communicate. I believe this gives us the ability to see that you can actually have multiple individuals within the same domain interacting with each other, those above and below and on a par, yet at the same time having those obstacles to comprehension, those obstacles to estimation, those obstacles to truly understanding the richness of this world, and I would add, therefore, the ability to deny their true reality. Another analogy, which I think gives us a way to understand this, um, is the example I gave previously of two brothers standing shoulder to shoulder on Main Street. One of those brothers, um, for example, um, being involved in drug dealing, in prostitution, in human trafficking, in theft. This individual who, for example, hates people of another color, loathes other cultures, and his identical twin brother standing next to him, who is the antithesis of that first. This individual tries his best to understand the world of intellect, the science, history, psychology, sociology. At the same time, he uses everything that he has to the best of his ability to try and heal the world, to make it a better place. He sacrifices his time Instead of going out to sell drugs, he goes out to help people of the homeless community. He speaks on equality of men and women, strives to unite people, to dissolve prejudices and hate, and even, again the antithesis of his brother, goes out and does what he can to understand other cultures, listen to their music, understand their religions, understand their philosophies and how they see the world. Now these two individuals stand side by side, and I would suggest that in one sense, yes, they are able to interact with each other. At the same time, they do not inhabit the same world. Now, in the physical sense, they might see the same things. For example, they might see a camera. One sees the ability to actually create pornography, something which is toxic to humankind. The other sees that same camera as the ability to bridge chasms between different cultures, between different races, between different religions, and sees it as a way to actually create beauty in the world. Once again, they don't see the same thing. 
even though they see the same thing. And obviously, one brother attempting to communicate the profound sweetness of finally being able to appreciate, say, a musical tradition that was foreign to him, or the ability to reach through the barriers of language and touch another person's heart from a different culture, or understand their philosophy, their worldview, their religion. This would fall on deaf ears to the other brother. Because when he sees a human being, he sees a commodity. The other one sees a ray of light with the potential to unite the world. When one sees a woman, he sees an equal partner. He sees something in this individual that is just like what is in him. Whereas the other brother actually sees, again, really something to be used. Something either to be used as a sensual service to sell, or as a potential addicted customer. This is what I think are the barriers between these two grades of being. Another very sad analogy that can help us to understand um, the relationship of being in the next world, and not being able to access, if you will, or truly see, while at the same time being able to interact with those on a level higher than us, or on a par with us, um, is the problem of addiction. Uh, I have had the very, very sad, um, if you will, experience of both having been addicted to chemicals in my own past, as well as having, as well as having really lost friends uh, to the same kinds of addiction. When you're speaking to somebody who is in the throes of addiction, they can hear you. They can hear what you're saying. Yet at the same time, they don't hear you. They don't understand the meaning or the import of what it is that you're saying to them. They are, if you will, caged inside the addiction, while still being able to move about freely with you. Uh, very often I've had the experience of talking to friends and trying to communicate to them the beauty of the freedom of being out from under the shackles, if you will, of addiction. And they hear me. And some part of them actually really, really does know, because they remember that world, even if it's only a faint echo. At the same time, they don't hear me. Because if they did, they would drop the addiction. And as I said, I myself battled with addiction in my past, when I was in my 20s. Someone comes up to you and starts communicating how this is harming your body, or preventing your mind from working properly. And there's a part of you that understands that but you can't fully hear them, or you can't fully see what they're saying. Um, and this is really the same issue. In the next world, if we had chosen to be the one brother who is himself dealing in human trafficking and drug dealing and drug abuse, um, we will estimate our own worth at the time of our death, and we would cast our own selves into the fire meaning we would understand why it is that we're being given the sense capacities in the bodies that we are, in accordance with our understanding, with our faith, and with our conduct. But once we're in that, if you will, vehicle in the next world, and someone begins to tell us of the melodies of righteousness, of the beautiful fragrance of service and sacrifice, we won't be able to smell it. We won't be able to hear those melodies. And in the end, this is why we are going to be able to actually turn away from them, even there. And I think this is why, if we take the analogy of the one quote from Shoghi Effendi in a previous video, where she tell, or sorry, where he tells the wife that her husband is beginning to see spiritual truth for what it really is, and appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah. It is because that individual obviously didn't develop those capacities in this world. He is somewhat developing them in the next world, but he moved from a place without those senses, and moved into a vehicle again that did not have those senses. They can be cultured, they can be developed, they can be shared by analogy. We can communicate to people in such states the wondrous of the melodies of the manifestations of God. But given they cannot actually properly hear them for their own selves, but only can get an inkling of them, they can still deny. 
the two origins of variation, inherent and chosen. The following is from Abdullah. As for material beings, they are not to be blamed, judged, or held accountable for their own degrees and stations. Thus the mineral, the plant, and the animal are each acceptable in their own degree. But if they were to remain deficient in that degree, they would be blameworthy, the degree itself being wholly perfect. Now the differences among mankind are twofold. One is a difference of degree, and this difference is not blameworthy. The other is a difference with respect to faith and certitude, the absence of which is blameworthy. For the soul must have fallen prey to its own lusts and passions, to have been deprived of this bounty, and bereft of the attractive power of the love of God. However praiseworthy and acceptable it may be in its human degree, Yet as it is deprived of the perfections of that degree, it has become a source of deficiency and is held accountable for that reason. So in this quote we're told that there are different origins of the variation and diversity of stations in the next world. Um, there is no doubt that in this world we do not all have the same capacities. We, want, we might really want to wish that were true, uh, but it's not the case. Um, I have met individuals in my life that have a much higher intellectual capacity than my own. I have met individuals who seem at least to have a greater immediacy of their ability to be emotionally stable, with higher levels of physical prowess. And I know some of these are related to the very nature of the vehicle into which I have been placed in this world. I do not, however, believe that any of these capacities, the limits on any of these capacities, are salvation-related, to use that term. An individual, no matter what their capacity, can recognize truth and beauty and purpose. They can find it, and they can actually seize upon it. They can, if you will, using the analogy of the quote from the Bob about each each station or each degree having within it its own levels of perfection, the levels of perfection within the mineral, or the plant, or the animal, and the human. Within the capacity of our own selves, we have perfections that we can acquire, and we are judged on whether or not we develop these perfections. That is when the end, where we're really coming to the place of those that are chosen. I think that human beings are far, far, far more aware of what actual evil is, and what darkness is, of what we're capable of ourselves, and in both directions, depravity and nobility. That generally we know and can sense that there is a station above ourselves of knowledge and of nobility that we can actually achieve. And it is upon this that we are actually truly judged. Now let us consider the soul. We have seen that movement is essential to existence. Nothing that has life is without motion. All creation, whether of the mineral, vegetable, or animal kingdom, is compelled to obey the law of motion. It must either ascend or descend. But with the human soul there is no decline. Its only movement is towards perfection. Growth and progress alone constitute the motion of the soul. In the world of the spirit there is no retrogression. The world of mortality is a world of contradictions, of opposites. Motion being compulsory, everything must either go forward or retreat. In the realm of spirit there is no retreat possible. All movement is bound to be towards a perfect state. Progress is the expression of spirit in the world of matter. The intelligence of man, his reasoning powers, his knowledge, his scientific achievements, all these being manifestations of the spirit, partake of the inevitable law of spiritual progress and are therefore of necessity immortal. In this quote, we're told that with the human soul there is no decline. 
that the only movement is towards perfection, and growth and progress alone constitute the motion of the soul. There is no retreat possible, which is also said. And then it says that the intelligence of man, his reasoning powers, his knowledge, his scientific achievements, partake of the inevitable law of spiritual progress. So it sounds as if, in the domains above, that there is no retrogression in the cosmos. And we have to understand this within the context of all the other quotes that we actually find. That an individual, really early on in this series, I think in one of the, uh, the first lectures, in stage one, it's said that an individual can f start and progress along, and yet at the last moment fall to the lowest level and not know. Um, this would actually not know you're in hell in one of the other stages. Now, in this context, it means on the one hand we can, and on the other hand we can't. So how do we actually reconcile this? I think one of the ways to offer how we can reconcile this is that there are infinite worlds of God. We are told that actually we move through worlds of God. And in a sense, there are membranes between these worlds. We are told, in this case, that there is a membrane, if you will, between the world we are in and the world we're going to. Um, that threshold is death. We develop in this life, if you will, the embryo of our body, the vehicle we will inhabit in the next world. And as we actually reach death, we are still being able to actually, if you will, develop and foster that body. When we pass, we move into it. And in that world, we assume the form uh, consummate, or sorry, commensurate with what actually we have done in this life. And I think this gives us a way to understand how there can be no retrogression, and at the same time how we can fall. When we move into the next world, we can move along a path of spiritual perfections. We can come to recognize truths we never did before. We can recognize beauties we had never seen before. We can learn to hear the melodies of justice. We can learn to smell the fragrance of self-sacrifice, even if in the previous life we were not able. It may be difficult because we have the veil of a lack of senses, but we're told specifically within the Baha'i writings that we can progress. Now, I would suggest the ability to fall back to the first level is within each world. But when we move to another world, there are realizations that are suddenly forced upon us in another judgment. For example, uh, I've been asked before in a, a fireside if I believe that someone who is an atheist, uh, when they die, um, well, they know, they'll obviously know that there is a God. And I had once said, well, I'm not entirely sure about that. They would definitely know that there's something after death, <laughs> that there is actually a stage beyond. But there might still be a doubt as to whether there is one ultimate supreme entity behind, if you will, behind the scenes of it all. That's for another time. Uh, but in this case, I use it as an example, is if in this world you denied that you had an existence after the destruction of the physical body, or the abstract aspects, the intangible aspects of our human reality, those being our virtues and our intellect could move on, you're going to find out you were wrong. Yeah, there's no ability at that point to actually deny that there is a life beyond. It has, if you will, been forced upon you. And I believe if we look into the writings more deeply on this subject, we'll realize that we do find that actually there are certain truths and certain realities that are forced beyond us uh, in our passage from world to world. And some of that will come up later on in this and subsequent lectures. Um, and this gives us the ability to see how we can fall to the lowest depths and not know within a certain world, within a certain life, yet at the same time there is a progress that is, if you will, inevitable that is forced upon us. Um, I would suggest how else can we make sense of this given we're told that this world is a mirror or a reflection of the next, and we can see that people actually can, if you will, go backwards in their spiritual progress. They can turn from being a very good person to a very bad person. They can lose their knowledge. They can even ignore their own capacities. Yet that there will be, if you will, that reckoning, that stage of existence where they pass from the threshold of this life to the next, and they will be forced to realize, and certain things they will not be able to remove from their memory. 
This is also related, I believe, to this notion of uh, stagnation. That this inevitable law of progress does continue, if you will, updating us through our moving through these different membranes, these different veils of world to world, but we can live in a world that truly, truly stagnate. Um, I myself, and I think most of us, have known people who you know, got to a certain level of, uh, if you will, maturity, a certain level of intellect, a certain level of emotional maturity, or spiritual maturity in the sense of our virtues and our vision of the great purpose of existence, and they never move past it. They can actually stay within this domain, and I think once again the same is true of the next world. At times in studying any subject within the Baha'i writings we can come across a certain quote. And it really grips us and it stands out to us, and we take that to be, if you will, the penultimate statement. And we have to be wary of this. Uh, there is one quote where the Guardian says that uh, oftentimes we see two concepts uh, that seem at odds with each other, but if we follow them through, we will see that they are united. Which means at times we can find one quote that seems to suggest one thing, but the actual full truth of it is the case, if you will. It's the reason I, I do my best to try and make sure that there is a lot of quotes within these talks, and to share as much as I can, but I know myself um, throughout my Baha'i life, I've been a Baha'i for 20 years, and I've been studying it for 20 years, I consistently find that something I previously thought was bang on true was wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure that if I'm doing uh, this right, meaning uh, doing my best to understand the Baha'i writings and grow as an individual, that many of the things I say now will be seen as wrong, <laughs> and even immature in the future. Um, I think this is the case with one concept that has often arisen in discussions about the next world, and that is, is that we do not have free will in the next world. It's like the one where we you know there's no sense of the physical or no sense of time that we have looked at previously, um, that it doesn't seem to be what often we take it to be. So this is the, the question really about a, a quote from Abdu'l Baha where he talks about the means of progress in the next world, that of the grace, of the manifestation of God, uh, of prayer or deeds done on our behalf. And I would suggest really this is just, not just, uh, this is the great discussion about the relationship between grace and works. Unto each one has been prescribed a preordained measure as decreed in God's mighty and guarded tablets. All that which ye potentially possess can, however, be manifested only as a result of your own volition. Your own acts testify to this truth. Uh, in this quote we're told that where you can only manifest the prescribed measure that we have been given uh, according to our own volition. So it takes our own volition to really bring out the minds or the gems placed within us. The following quote um, is from Baha'u'llah as well. And now concerning thy question whether human souls continue to be conscious one of another after their separation from the body. Know thou that the souls of the people of Baha, who have entered and been established within the crimson ark, shall associate and commune intimately one with another and shall be so closely associated in their lives, their aspirations, their aims and strivings, as to be even as one soul. In this quote, it's talking about the people of Baha, and that in the worlds beyond we will actually be closely associated in lives, aspirations, aims, and strivings, which means that we will actually have aspirations, aims, and strivings, um, and that once again, I would suggest there is the issue of volition here, because those capacities, those perfections we have in those worlds beyond, can once again only be manifested as a result of our own volition. But then again we have quotes like the following. The tenderness of thy mercy, O my Lord, surpasseth the fury of thy wrath, and thy loving kindness exceedeth thy hot displeasure, and thy grace excelleth thy justice. Hold thou, through thy wondrous favours and mercies, the hands of thy creatures, and suffer them not to be separated from the grace which thou hast ordained as a means thereby they can recognise thee. Here we have the statement by Baha'u'llah 
that it is the grace which thou hast ordained as the means whereby they can recognize thee. So it actually seems here that it is only by grace that we actually recognize the manifestations of God. Or in one sense, it's the grace by which we can recognize God himself. And this is a question um, that, if you will, deals with the issues of justice and grace in the next world, and it's going to recur later on. But we see that in some sense it's only by a result of our own volition, and at the same time it is only through grace. But note here that it is only through his grace that we recognize him. For the highest and most excelling grace bestowed upon men is the grace of attaining unto the presence of God and of his recognition, which has been promised unto all people. This is the utmost degree of grace vouchsafed unto man by the all-bountiful, the ancient of days, and the fullness of his absolute bounty upon his creatures. So in this quote, the highest and most excelling grace bestowed upon men is attaining under the presence of God and his recognition. Once again, it is through his grace that we have been able to actually recognize the manifestation of God and attain his presence. In the following quote, we're told that it is through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit that we are actually able to progress for the power of man is limited and the divine power is boundless. Here from Abdul Baha. In the teachings of Baha'u'llah it is written, By the power of the Holy Spirit alone is man able to progress. For the power of man is limited and the divine power is boundless. The reading of history brings us to the conclusion that all truly great men, the benefactors of the human race, those who have moved men to love the right and hate the wrong, and who have caused real progress, all these have been inspired by the force of the Holy Spirit. So it is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God's grace that propels us. And this is actually a really deep and rich concept in how the relationship of the Holy Spirit and the manifestations of God actually influence individual lives and also the timeline of history uh, for another time. For now, we're going to move to another quote from Abdu Baal. As to the soul of man after death, it remains in the degree of purity to which it has evolved during life in the physical body. And after it is freed from the body, it remains plunged in the ocean of God's mercy. From the moment of the soul leaves the body and arrives in the heavenly world, its evolution is spiritual. And that evolution is the approaching unto God. In the physical creation, evolution is from one degree of perfection to another. The mineral passes with its mineral perfections to the vegetable. The vegetable, with its perfections, passes to the animal world, and so on to that of humanity. This world is full of seeming contradictions. In each of these kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal, life exists in its degree, though when compared to the life in a man, the earth appears to be dead, yet she too lives and has a life of her own. In this world things live and die, and live again in other forms of life, but in the world of the spirit it is quite otherwise. The soul does not evolve from degree to degree as a law, it only evolves nearer to God, by the mercy and bounty of God. So in this quote, we're told that the soul of man after death uh, remains in the degree of purity to which it has evolved during life. We pass away, we have, if you will, this reckoning, this sudden realization of our true reality, and we are given a body. In this body we then move through the worlds beyond. And this world has these degrees. And in each of these degrees, we actually have perfections that we can actually acquire. Heron has brought this notion at the same time of this degrees of existence. He says, for example, that 
life exists in each, in each degree, though when compared to the life of man, the earth appears to be dead. Yet she too lives and has a life of her own. This gives us once again that notion that you can have different grades and stations in the next world. But it says here that the soul does not evolve from degree to degree as a law. It only evolves nearer to God by the mercy and the bounty of God. So you have these different degrees and stations. You have them here. You have them in the next world, and you also have infinite worlds of God with degrees and stations. Yet in some sense, it is only through the grace of God that we actually move from one of these kingdoms unto the other. In like manner, the holy manifestations of God are the focal centers of the light of truth, the wellsprings of the hidden mysteries, and the source of the effusions of divine love. They cast their effulgence upon the realm of hearts and minds, and bestow grace everlasting upon the world of the spirits. They confer spiritual life and shine with the splendor of inner truths and meanings. The enlightenment of the realm of thought proceeds from those centers of light and exponents of mysteries. Were it not for the grace of the revelation and instruction of those sanctified beings, the world of souls and the realm of thought would become darkness upon darkness. Were it not for the sound and true teachings of those exponents of mysteries, the human world would become the arena of animal characteristics and qualities. All existence would become a vanishing illusion, and true life would be lost. That is why it is said in the Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, that is, it was the source of all life. In this quote, it's interesting because we're told it is the grace of their of the revelation and instruction of their sound and true teachings that we actually progress, and that the human world would become an arena of animal characteristics and qualities. A statement related to kingdom, one being human and one being animal or animalistic. In this sense, we get once again a gateway into understanding what's actually being said. The grace of God, which enables us to progress, is actually through the instruction and teaching of the manifestations of God. Why? Because we do not earn the coming of Christ, if you will. We do not earn through our good works the revelation of the Buddha, or of the Prophet Muhammad, or of Krishna, or of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. It is purely by the grace and bounty of God that his manifestations of God are sent here, and we can then actually recognize them by their grace, through them being sent, through our own volition, and begin to ascend from the animal world, the world of baser qualities, into the realm of the human. Those of the human qualities of abstract reasoning, of scientific understanding, of the virtues of the human kind, of self-sacrifice. So here we get an insight into what it means by it being purely by their grace.